Um, so I have the uh, pleasure of greeting, once again, my colleagues. Um, John Chapman is a senior manager for, meta, senior product manager, excuse me, for metadata services in OCLC, where he oversees cataloging applications and helps to link direct our linked data strategy. I need some elocution lessons at this time of the day. Uh, and also presenting with John is Jean Godby, who's a senior research scientist at OCLC within OCLC Research. Uh, Jean has a PhD in linguistics from Ohio State University and leads uh, one of our teams of stellar engineers on uh, projects involving linked data and data science. So welcome to John and Jean. So we're gonna uh, have a, a sandwich type of uh, format today. So I'm gonna lead us off. I'll turn it over to Gene, and then I'll also wrap up. Um, many of the slides that we'll present, um, you've seen already, the list of participants and such, so I'll move very quickly through those. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the reasons for the project and start here on the um, slide with our fancy diagram. So over the last uh, three to four years, we've been working on producing linked data beyond just the uh, VF and FAST resources that are heavily used in the community. Uh, to create entities. Uh, we started with works, moved on to persons, and I was involved in a project called the Person Entity Lookup Service where we clustered together um, roughly 20 million uh, name entities or person entities and then um, provided access to those via web services to provide some of the same lookup and disambiguation use cases that we just saw. Um, but the one thing that we heard right away was this is great and all, but what if I'm not finding the person that I want to refer to? What can you provide for us there? And so an important goal of this project was to uh, provide the opportunity for users <coughs> to mint um, new, new entities, new linked data entities. And we um, were given a pretty tight timeline as well. So we were given a timeline of nine months to, to pursue this. And um, I'll uh, get into why that's important to consider as well. So uh, despite our best efforts to keep it internal, um, Project Passage, that phrase just sort of got released into the environment, and there it is. But um, we thought it was pretty evocative in terms of um, uh, passing into a new uh, environment, but also having that sort of literary important uh, important phrase in the work as well. Um, what's important here then is to uh, look at the bolded verbs around reconciling, creating, and managing uh, bibliographic and authority data. Um, one of the big promises that we saw, and we saw the energy in the community, was around this notion of identity management and linking persons and works. Um, so this project generated 1.2 million entities, um, many of them persons, but also places, works, events, um, so it was broader than previous efforts. Participating libraries, including several libraries that are participating in this conference. And, um, you know, with the, with the prototype, um, I mentioned the goal around creation and editing of new entities, but we also wanted to make sure that we had as a goal uh, connecting these entities to the web. So instead of having a fairly uh, root-bound set of clusters that's just referring to other library data, we really wanted to offer the ability for libraries to link out uh, to resources elsewhere on the web. And um, that was actually uh, one of the most successful additions to the project was an application designed to do specifically that called the Retriever, um, which I don't can't, yeah, I think Gene will uh, show that or talk about that a little bit later. Um, also important to us and important to me as my role in our cataloging applications guy is uh, building a community of users, so a shared, a shared group. We did this through encouraging um, homework activities. Uh, we did this with what we call treasure hunts, which basically was an early effort to leverage the searching within the Wikibase software. Um, but we also really encourage people to tell us what wasn't there. Uh, what do you need to make this really useful? And that led to, within the nine month project, um, to get us some of these cool new applications that were added to the, to the base software. 
So with that nine month goal, when we kicked it off, um, we had to use software that was, um, that was out there, we couldn't write our own. And it was just a, it was a fortunate coincidence that we started doing it just after Wikibase really started providing software in a much easier to use fashion. So we, we, we hit that just perfectly. It was good, um, you know, good coincidence. Um, and just to mention here too, we wanted to provide um, ideas around exploring the data as well as just creating it because we all know one of the first things a lot of catalogers do after they add a record to the database is flip over to the discovery layer, make sure it looks correct, go back and tweak. So um, we wanted to have that rapid feedback into, especially in a new, new type of data model. What does this look like? How can I search it? Uh, what are the important things that are showing up? And so that built off of some earlier work as well that we had done around some sort of bento box uh, type of interfaces like uh, EntityJS is a really lightweight viewer uh, that Gene's, um, Gene's team worked on. Um, and before I hand it over to Gene, I do want to um, name a few colleagues that helped out uh, in a big way. So Gene's team includes Bruce Washburn, who's here at this event, also Jeff Mixter. Um, on my team, I only spent like 10 hours a week on this, but um, uh, on my team, uh, Sarah Newell, AKA now Sarah DeSmit uh, led the community-based project, so sort of project manager, and um, is owed a lot of uh, praise for her work on this project. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jean, and she'll explain more details. Thank you, Jean. So before we get into this, uh, I, I just wanna let you know that that we're, we're in a, another phase of the project, which is the, the write-up, and I'm, I'm the senior author of a report that's gotten kind of big, and my, my co-author, Karen smith Joshi Morris in the audience, and, and we're, it will be, it's nearing uh, release. It's in the early stages of publication, and we're expecting it to be available shortly after ALA, but between now and then, we will be, you know, uh, writing blog posts and stuff and, and, and letting some of that material out. So um, in among the, the um, participants of this, of this pilot, several people from what, five institutions stepped up to help us seven. be, seven institutions stepped up to help us be co-authors. And that was an incredibly interesting experience. I, I think it's probably, the most amount of peer review I've ever gotten on anything in my career, but but it was a very interesting experience, and and, and I think five of the authors are here, and I don't think any of anyone except Karen is in the room today, but will represent their work. So um, with that, we what we try to do in that report is to give a sense of what was going through the person's head as they were <coughs> confronting this issue. And so the report is structured as, a, as a, a background and then a technical background and then a set of case studies that the, that the mostly um, library community co-authors agreed to share with us and, and write up where, where, where they talked about what they did and why and how that compared with what they're doing. And then something like 15 pages of reflections. And so I'll try to sample a little bit of that in the rest of my talk today. And so where I want to start is a place that a lot of talks have started on in this conference, but I, but I don't think this particular point has been made. And so obviously what we'll be doing, what we did in this was to use the uh, Wikibase editing interface <coughs> as it was installed in Passage to create resource descriptions that were natively linked data. And the point I want to make here as I go through this is that it looks conceptually simple. So you, you, it, there, there are two different parts to it. So one part is to create a bunch of labels for the name of the person, alternate names, and, 
and, and in Wikibase, that's known as the fingerprint data, and that's used to uniquely identify that that person in this case from the perspective of a, of a keyword searching. And if you start a search, you can see in this inset that somebody's searching for Ann Davis, and they haven't finished spelling it out. But that that data supports an auto suggest function. And earlier today. Um, we heard a presentation by Xiaoli um, Li, who showed that the that you could edit this fingerprint data in multiple languages. And she, and in her case study, she flipped back and forth between the English language view and the Chinese language view, and put English language fingerprint labels in in the English version and Chinese in the other one, and that has huge implications for the way people catalog multilingual data. You don't have to spend time doing transcriptions, or, or if you're bilingual between Chinese and Russian, you don't have to come up with Cyrillic trans transcriptions of this cultural object that is important in, in Chinese history, for example. So that, that has enormous implications. And then the other thing is the structured data. And so, the, the process is simple. You know, you, you have this thing that you want to describe, you create some labels for it, and then you start creating structured data. But that's only one mindset. There, there are two more. And one is that th this sort of looks like authority control. And you can look at, at the, the elements of, of the Wikibase environment, or, or editing environment, and, and start sort of mentally mapping them. And so you can see a preferred name in there, you can see alternate names in there, you can scroll through the structured data, and you can see, oh, those are a bunch of Mark Authority 024s, and then you have the, the actual structured statements themselves, and you think, oh, well, those are machine readable, but you know, Mark Authority is a machine readable too. And so this is not at all alien, but you have to, but, and, and so I think that's why there was such easy uptake into this. And, and, the, and this example shows a, a person description, which has an obvious correlate to name authority description. But, but for creative works, it was similar. You know, the people can map those. Although, you know, the creative works problem because of differences in modeling, that's a little bit more fraught. And that's obviously a, a thing for future reference. So um, a third mindset is the how you mentally map this to link data concepts. And so just looking at that same interface again, you can say, well, Andy Davis is the name of this thing, or this entity, or this real world object. And there's a URI associated with it that, that comes from, uh, that's built from uh, an identifier. And that's our globally unique persistent URI that we would put in dollar one fields and mark records. And then you have statements which constitute the structured data or the triples. And so when you think about having to keep these three mindsets in your head at the same time, that's a little bit complex conceptually. And it's made slightly more complicated by the fact that there, there are a couple of unfortunate terminology clashes. And so in, in linked data, you have, you, you, you call that real world object an entity, and then and in Wikidata, that, that entity is the content of a page. And so there are clashes like that that you have to sort of work your way through. But if you can get there, two good things happen. So one is that you can interact with this fairly simple interface to get um, uh, linked data without having to write code. And the second is that you can start down the path of entifying your data, the library data. So a, a, a library authority file now becomes a person entity. And, and so that's a, that's a nice transformation. And we have, as, as was mentioned multiple times, we have a couple of utilities that we built, the, the user discovery view through, through um, the Explorer and through the Retriever, which allows you to um, look at things in, in the editing workflow and bring in external sources. And actually, Bruce is talking about that in a parallel session now. So just a quick, um, couple of quick observations about the case studies. 
So in case studies, we, we let people propose what they wanted to describe. And this is a sampling, and these are the ones that are described in the report. But it is a sampling. And the people who did this sort of internalized this. So, so now it's an alternative way of thinking about any kind of new resource description task that you have. And we've heard multiple times throughout this conference that, that the, the authors of this work are continuing to think in terms of, of what they learned in passage and, and the new things that they've undertaken. So um, a, a couple, I'll just say a couple of things about two of them. And so one, this is from the University of Minnesota, and Kaylin Davis was the author for us. And she was looking at this Everly Brothers poster, which is from a, collect, a, a collection of posters that is available in digitized form from the University of Minnesota. And the fascinating thing about this is that there was this relatively obscure place, um, Glenwood, Minnesota, Lakeside Ballroom, where in the 1960s, a whole bunch of famous people passed through. And so what we had to do in, in this description was to figure out what are the entities that, that are important for describing that? What connections do you want to make? And so creating the labels is the first step. But if you create labels for things that you haven't defined yet, you've created extra work because you want to actually link to them. And so these are the things that we ended up actually creating as other related entities to describe this thing. And this was a very deep experience for Kaylin in particular, and she wrote very eloquently about this in, in her, in her um, write-up for our, our report. And she said that, as we catalog in this new environment, we're forced to think through the answer to this question, what entities matter to this object? This will drive the construction of the future bibliographic universe, and it will perhaps supersede the traditional rationale for bibliographic description which focuses on the item at hand and is informally referred to in Cutter's now infamous cult of the, of the title page. OK, so I'm getting instructions to start wrapping up. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this next example kind of quickly, and, and, I'll leave, and the slides will be available for you know, reflection later. But it turns out that a lot of interesting issues were raised in the description of of items and archives and special collections. And the, the issues had to do with the fact that these don't, the, these items and these collections don't necessarily have a lot of structured data associated with them already. So there was a lot of work to do. You had to describe the institutional context in which this thing appeared, plus you had to describe what was in that, that photo in a sense that is maybe different from what you're used to. And so there was a lot of work and there were a lot of questions raised about, about who would do this work and how that relates to current practice, which doesn't emphasize creating a lot of metadata for special collections. And so it, it sort of implies that you would need to change your modes of practice or invoke the the potential for the wiki-based software to do a lot of crowdsourcing for you. And I'll skip through this in the interest of time. But a couple of lessons learned from the pilot. The editing workflow appears simple, but that's deceptive. And there are a lot of uh, psychological complexities to it. And that the consumption and creation of linked data is always mediated, um, unlike a mark record where you can see the totality of what you created. With linked data, you're always sampling it, querying it, um, you know, coming up with some some indirect way of seeing what you did, and that and that was psychologically uncomfortable to a lot of people. And then the third thing that we learned was that R and D for around special collections would, is is rich with research potential, and we're going to try to follow up on that in, in the work that we do next. And so there were a lot of reflections in this about whether this, this, this represents a paradigm shift and how we plug in crowdsourcing to this text. So um, what we'll do next, we're already starting to see the next steps in this conference. And, and when we talk more about what's happening at OCLC, we'll just continue with that. But obviously, we have our, our Wiki, Wikimedia and, and Wikipedia involvement through Mary Lee's work. We have a lot of follow-on work with um, 
with digital objects through our, our, our triple, I, triple IF research that we're, that we're already talking about in public. And we're looking for ways of uh, fostering collaboration between Wikidata and, and the library community. And so for that, for that I'll go and finish up. That one might have an open face sandwich, but I'm coming back from the other piece of bread here. So, um, so yeah, uh, next up, as Jean mentioned, the report, which I think is, what, 50 pages or so? Mm -hmm. no, 50, okay. <laughs> yeah, 57 pages. We'll be out soon after ALA, but we'll have some teasers between now and then. Uh, we'll be continuing, uh, internally, we're continuing to work with Wikibase and test out its potential. Um, one of those areas of potential, as you saw uh, from the use cases, is special collections and archival materials. Um, and so our content DM team is uh, running up another program soon, so I'll look for news about that. Um, obviously, we're in, uh, closely involved multiple groups of the PCC that are exploring uh, related topics. Uh, lots of committees and groups um, that OCLC staff are participating in. But really, we're seeing that these are really new techniques uh, being put to use for the same goals that, you know, around shared cataloging and community that OCLC has been uh, working through. So what are the efficiencies in the total network, as well as at individual libraries, that we can enable through the use of these tools? So can we move um, from record-based models, in some cases, to an effort that's maximizing efficiency of the entire uh, metadata environment. So um, a link um, to a page that has information about our linked data activities, and that's where the full report will land when it is published. So thank you very much. So the, um, we did use the vanilla wiki base um, out of the box. Um, however, we also added uh, services for ingesting data. We used some of the bots that, that are available, the PyWikiBot and some other services. And I think uh, Home built a few uh, import tools. And then the two major tools that were added in addition were the Explorer, which was the kind of friendlier interface that you saw. So what that did was essentially use the links um, that were stored in the entity description to, at, at render time, pull in text from other sources or photos and display that. So that was one application. The other application was the Explorer. So the Explorer was in response to, uh, this entity is not in the database, but I know it's out in Wikidata. I'd like to bring that in as a starter and then enhance it. So that one was set up. Um, some specific services. I think it was Wiki, uh, Wikidata, Geonames, and a couple others uh, that you could do that with. And so those were the two major additions. I'd like to um, issue a little correction that, that he, he was talking about the, the retriever. And, and actually, there was a um, last minute change in our schedule here, and our colleague Bruce Washington was supposed to be here in this session, but he actually got pulled away and is talking about the retriever in the parallel session. So, so there, that'll be in the in the proceedings for the report. Um, something else that we worked on, um, which was not covered in the talk, but was very useful, was um, we extended the Sparkle query generator um, and built a whole bunch of examples, and also leveraged in some additional viewers, like the timeline viewer and stuff. Um, and so. 
um, that really opened up minds in a different way than the interface in terms of what was possible with querying this data versus querying a standard mark data uh, database. Yeah, and at this point, I think it would be worthwhile to maybe amplify a point about the about the explorer. Not only is it pulling in um, material from from DBpedia and other sources to create this this bento box view, but it also um, does Sparkle queries across the entire um, wiki base or, or the entire passage data set, and is collecting information that is not in one place in any wiki-based entity. And the, and the example that Karen showed in her talk earlier today showed the effect of that, where if you're looking at Zion on site and, and all of the translations, that's not in any one place. That had to be populated using a, a, a Sparkle query to, to find that. And in the process of doing that, um, we were able to populate the model that she's describing. That, with the work, the works and their translations and their translators, and so that was the point of that. So that model sort of got retrospectively discovered in that data that a lot of other people created because some of that data about Zion site was imported from from Wikidata. Yeah, the, um, the that had that was sort of a standard module to sort of uh, query to what links to this entity. And it sat kind of to the right of. Uh, to the right of her picture under that uh, under that call out, but it had some interesting effects. Like if you went to a, um, a genre, um, which we have you know, pages for that as a as a thing, then you could see subgenres. Uh, but one of the most interesting was effects were if you went to an entity for a university, you could see uh, professors from that university who were famous folks, scientists, and all that sort of thing. So. Um, it, it led people to think about new relationships that could be made in other entities to point to the entity that they were viewing, which was kind of cool. Yeah, and, and um, there, there's a lot here that has implications for UI development. And so we can sort of get a preview of what we would want the UI to show just by issuing Sparkle queries and saying, yes, for a work in its translations, you want to see the list of translations, but but you may not want that for other thing, other types of resources, and so it gave us a, a really um, productive platform for experimenting with ideas. And and if I may, I can show the example that I ran through quickly that, that illustrates another kind of source of discomfort, and it's this example, and so. This is from Holly Tomron at um, Temple University, and um, her concern was that when you're writing a description of an item in a collection, you use a lot of narrative or expository data. And if you look at what she did in, in the fingerprint data, it's all very narrative. It's almost like a, a Dublin Core description summary or something. But she was struggling with trying to understand how you could create that context, and she wasn't convinced that you could do it through structured data as easily. And so a little um, type of diagram that we use in, in, the, in the paper gives a sense of what that knowledge graph would look like. And so at the bottom, you see her attempt to create context, and so you've got this photograph, and, and, it, de and it depicts an event, and these famous people were at it, and it, looked, it was located in this place. And it, and it looks like this complicated thing that you have to go to multiple uh, multiple entities to pull together the information that you needed in order to create this display. And and there and there was a sense of discomfort that she felt that that was a lot more work than just putting it in text, and which is what they would do in what they did in the description that they had. And it kind of shows that that there is. A, a user interface issue here that we that we could look at this and say, well, the user interface needs to be aware of how to render this stuff to create this context. And in the pro in the process of this pilot, you couldn't really go into this because it was original work to be describing an item in a collection in this way, and there wasn't enough critical mass there to train 
the explorer on it and, and get them to do get it to do sparkle queries across the entire collection because this is you know pretty much the only example of this that we had and so that's an example of how the, this is just getting started and there's a lot of work that could go in this direction that could be fruitful. Okay, so I was curious if you thought about the licensing options that could be available for the metadata that's created. So as Andrew mentioned, the, um, the project itself had a, a firm end date, so um, we learned from past experience that we didn't want to keep, keep this running without support. Um, so what we did at the outset, um, and uh, Andrew mentioned that we had a very demanding request. We said, you have to participate. There's no lurkers. But um, in that agreement, we also said, we'll give you all the data from this when you're done. So we made that available to the participants. We like the, uh, the presentation apparently because we have lots of questions. Um, how much data did you have to inject or load in and how much was created? Um, we did data in a couple rounds. The first round was by far the largest. I think that was a million, one million, yeah, 1.2 million. Um, and then we made a directed load of I think 40,000 works later in the project actually had to back out some for quality issues. Um, so, and then we had however, we're manually, however many were manually created, but that wasn't tens of thousands by any means. Um, so it's still probably 1.3 uh, million at the end. Yeah, yeah we, um, we had high hopes of doing lots of batch load, but just kind of So I'm just curious, did, um, did this spur additional projects or subsequent projects that you can talk about? Um, so the biggest, um, the biggest one right now um, is really the one that's coming up um, regarding content DM. Um, and that one's leveraging the uh, work that we've already done with IIIF um, and looking specifically at, at digital representations. And also uh, thinking about uh, ontological questions about mapping uh, archival data uh, to these um, data sets. So that was something that uh, was identified um, in the project and kind of related to Gene's point about the, the pros here, uh, the pros descriptions versus the structured data versus the point, pointing to files. Uh, so thinking about how the systems interoperate having plugins or lookups through the IIIF, being able to make descriptions about specific parts of an image, all those kind of fun things. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that, I'm actually working with Nathan Putnam, um, John's colleague, also in our CLC product management, but we're going to be recruiting from the OCLC Research Library Partnership people from especially the archival communities, um, because the focus of so much of our linked data work today as a community has been on more of the published mainstream type of things. And you know, the archivists don't even go to ALA generally. They have their own meetings, SAA. There's been decades of tension, if not debate, about archival approaches to describing materials rather than the library. So we see this as an opportunity to make sure that regardless of whether you use BibFrame, Scheme Network, or whatever linked data, that we fully understand the requirements they need to be shared in a linked data environment. Because how you communicate that is almost secondary. We need to know what it is that's most important to them. So we plan to start recruiting a monthly OCLC Research Library Partnership. A number of you are part of the partnership. Um, and looking for people who are willing to work with us on that. I'd just like to, we have, uh, we do have some more time left and I wanted to invite those of you who may have questions for the other presenters in this, um, in the session, things that you didn't get to ask before or uh, that 
we've subsequently thought of that we can bring, we can invite those people to come back up to the podium as well to, uh, to share more insights and wisdom. See if Tom has more questions. <laughs> I'm wondering, Mary Lee, if you could just go around and name everyone in the room. Oh my God. <laughs> I said no. <laughs> no, only if I call them all Diane. They're, they're, they're real names or just more? <laughs> I'm going to assign each of you a label. <laughs> Um, coming back here uh, shortly, just after 4.30 for the uh, final wrap-up and kisses and goodbyes before people, people head off. So uh, you have a little bit of time to um, figure out what your next step is. So once again, thank, please join me in thanking all of the wonderful speakers. Today.